for me, people do make decisions for a reason. They don't make them at random, and so that means to me they're still rational. But what it is about is a new understanding of what rationality is and uh, how it differs from how economists have traditionally conceived it. And what it's about is decision-making. It's an understanding of how people make decisions. The reason that's important is in the current situation is because the economy has been run on assumptions about how people make decisions that are just, it turns out, not true. There are, of course, real structural problems in the economy as well, and these have contributed to the crisis and to the recession. But classical economics says that if people are rational in the way that uh, economists traditionally understood it, that all these things will correct themselves. Clearly, that's, uh, that's not what's happened. So I think we, uh, we need to look at why, uh, why that's not happened. It's because of the decisions people make and how they make them. Finally, there's... Uh, an idea that I've seen a couple of times recently that it's a bunch of curiosities, you can do some nice tricks, but it doesn't really have much significance. Well, I think that as the macroeconomic theory develops around behavioural economics, we're going to see that it is hugely significant. Behavioural biases are what cause recessions, they're what actually lead to economic growth as well. And once we have a theory that can really understand that, then it will become the primary tool of economics in the future. Back in the 1960s, there was a, a trend in psychology to try and understand why people did the things they did. And Stanley Milgram conducted one of the most famous experiments in psychology ever, um, where he donned a white coat in Harvard, took a bunch of random average Americans and asked them to electrocute somebody to death. And before he did this experiment, he asked people, you know, how many people do you think will actually carry her through the electrocution? Well, nobody will. Only, only psychotics will do that. So it's going to be less than 0.01% of people will do this. What Milgram found, in fact, is under the right conditions, he could get about 67% of people uh, to electrocute somebody. In a less um, dramatic experiment, Milgram stood outside an underground station and looked up at the sky. And when he did this on his own, um, everybody just ignored him. When he did this with three friends, people would stop and start to look up at the sky um, to see what it was that Stanley Milgram and his friends were looking at. The point that Milgram was making through these experiments was that we were influenced by external environmental factors, not by our own internal decision-making capacities. Um, so we are driven by um, the external sources of information rather than by our own reason. Nobody would say they will kill somebody. The passers-by refused to believe they were looking up at the sky because other people were doing it. They claimed that they wanted to look up at the sky themselves. Nisbet and Wilson walked into a supermarket in the United States, laid out a trestle table, and put four identical pairs of socks onto the trestle table and asked the shoppers, which of these pairs of socks do you think is the best? And what they found was that on average, um, by a ratio of about four to one, people chose the pair of socks to the far right. And they would say that this pair of socks has the best colour, this pair of socks has the best feel to it. But the socks were actually all identical. When Nisbet and Wilson said to them, do you think the position of the socks might have made any difference to your decision, they looked at them as though they were slightly mad. Um, obviously, the position makes no difference to how good this pair of socks is. You, bur you burk. Now, this trend to see human beings as being driven by things they don't quite understand, that they don't quite see, has now become really fact. I mean, you look at the number of books and the number of articles that are coming out saying that we're driven by um, evolutionary psychology events that happened back on the savannah. On the savannah, apparently, um, we had to cooperate, so therefore there is a module um, for cooperation amongst human beings. And it's claimed that we're driven by all sorts of little nudges and little um, pointers. So if you receive a note in your hotel room, which I have actually now started to see, that says most of the guests in the hotel room um, re recycle their towels or reuse their towels, rather, you will find that more people will reuse their towels and so on and so forth. Another good example that's come out recently, which is, connects to the experiment that you just took part in, is that it's been demonstrated that the minimum payments on credit cards will tend to drive the payment that people actually pay. So I'm sure most people in here have a credit card. I'm sure every month you get um, your credit card bill. If you're the sort of person that pays it off, then it doesn't matter. But if you're the sort of person that doesn't pay it off, if the credit card companies say your minimum payment this month is £100, you're much more likely to pay £100. If they don't bother, you're actually more likely to pay more. And economists, behavioral economists, are saying that these kinds of things demonstrate our irrationality and demonstrate that we do things that we wouldn't ordinarily do or shouldn't do um, if we were really looking after our best interests. This is where I start to part company a little bit. 
it's true that we are driven often by these kinds of statistical contingencies, but that doesn't demonstrate that we're necessarily irrational. If you want to stay within the rules, if you want to hang on to your money, then following what the credit card company says as the minimum payment is a good thing to do. Another thing that uh, economists would say we're irrational because we walk into supermarkets and we buy things that are the last things we see. We buy things that are in our line of sight and so on and for so forth. So we're driven by the primes that are within the supermarket. Irrational, cry the behavioral economists. Well, again, not necessarily. If you're on a very limited budget, it might make sense to go into the supermarket and spend more time thinking about what it is you're buying and making sure that you put in your trolley is the cheapest that you can get. On the other hand, if you want to get your shopping done quickly and you want to enjoy it, then it's perhaps not such a bad idea to be driven by the primes that are in the shop and just accept that that's going to cost you more money. Again, it's not necessarily irrational. We can't understand whether somebody's behavior is rational or irrational until we understand the totality of their goals and their aims. And we are complex creatures. We have manifold goals. We have manifold aims. And we must take into account the totality of that in order to understand whether or not somebody's behaving rationally or irrationally. This diminished view of humans as being irrational is also, I think, is taps into a, a more sort of nefarious authoritarian um, um, trend that's occurring at the moment. So it's one thing for a supermarket to arrange its shelves and organize itself so as to extract the most money from you. I kind of expect my supermarkets to do that, and I'm ready and prepared for it. But increasingly, governments are starting to say, well, why don't you organize your supermarket shelves so as to encourage people to eat healthier food? That I find a little bit more nefarious. What I put into my mouth, what I decide to eat is my business. I don't like the idea that I'm being manipulated with regards to my diet. I can make those kinds of decisions for myself. Thank you very much. And that's just one example. There's lots of little nefarious um, authoritarian um, angles um, to this. And then the final point I would make is that while all of this maybe is very interesting and it's all you know, quite exciting that we can, dictate, we can predict how people will spend their money, when they will spend it, and so on and so forth, I really don't buy Lee's point this in any way connects to the real economy. The fact is, is that how much money people spend on their credit cards each month is a very, very limited interest um, to what happens at the level of the real economy. Um, it could be that it's a marginally better thing if people pay more off. It could be that it's a marginally worse thing if people pay more off because credit cards will make less money. But it's hard to see how any of this can connect to um, an increase in productivity and improvement in the basis of the real economy. So it's um, wrong to reach the conclusion that we're irrational based on behavioral economics. It's wrong to introduce um, authoritarian policies off the back of it. And it's wrong to think this connects in any way um, to the real economy. The way I see behavioral economics is um, that it's an aspiration to make sort of psychologically uh, realistic assumptions about human behavior in economic models. So moving towards some realism in the models. Whether behavioral economics can offer any explanations to what caused the crisis. Here I want to change that perspective a little bit and I want to talk about um, whether behavioral economics can tell us something about how we interpret the crisis after it happened. I think this is important because the way we interpret the events also shape how we respond to those events. To be sure, I think that behavioral economics has something to say also about the causes. Uh, for example, it may tell us something about why people thought um, how real estate prices would perpetually go up. You know, this has something to do with how people predict sort of random sequences. You know, there are experiments that relate to these things. I think sort of the major thing about the crisis was that there was a gap between individual incentives and the and and the goals of the society, and, the, and this gap can be, in the future, should be probably removed by designing better systems where, you know, what people are trying to maximize is more in line with what is good for us as a whole. It seems to me that there is a fair, fairly widespread belief that markets didn't do a very good job in promoting efficiency, and in particular, uh, sort of this death of so-called efficient market hypothesis. So this seems to be invoked quite frequently. So what is this efficient market hypothesis? It's the idea that um, all publicly available information is somehow reflected in market prices. Okay, so when you look at prices today, it reflects all available information. But many people thought, think that you know, uh, the crisis was obvious all along. Uh, you know, it was inevitable. You know, even the Queen asked, you know, how come nobody saw the crisis coming? So then the conclusion goes, you know, given that this was so obvious all along, or should have been so obvious all along, Efficient market hypothesis must be wrong. Uh, there is room for government to come in and regulate and help the markets work better. So how correct is this view? I believe that this uh, view itself can be understood from 
perhaps a behavioral perspective. Psychologists showed in the 70s that when a person receives a piece of information uh, and is asked uh, what uh, you know, he or she believed uh, before receiving this information, they tend to underestimate the importance of this information in shaping their beliefs. So, uh, in other words, they misestimate the benefit of hindsight. The psychologists did further experiments and they found that this effect, this hindsight bias, the fact that we don't appreciate how much knowing something shapes our beliefs, so we cannot even imagine not having this information anymore. Uh, this is particularly potent when we can glue sort of the uh, causes to the outcomes through some sort of a story. Uh, that it's not random, but there was some sort of uh, explanation to everything. So coming back to the crisis, so how obvious was the crisis before it happened? Well, I, to me it seemed that it was less obvious. However, once it happened, an explanation emerged, which was all about you know, the, um, that irresponsible lending, that people couldn't pay back the mortgages, that uh, you know, incentives uh, were all wrong, and uh, con you know, financial instruments were so complex, that which set the stage for hindsight bias. So we thought that, well, since it was so obvious all along, efficient market hypothesis must be wrong. So if you want to sort of appreciate the power of the efficient market hypothesis, we can also ask ourselves uh, what's going to happen in the next six months. Okay? And, you know, if you look at the newspapers, you know, some people say, well, there was a bit of a recovery recently, so everyone says, well, perhaps uh, things are getting better, there are all these green shoots. Other people say, well, um, you know, uh, this is just a dead cat uh, bounce. So which one is it? Well, I don't know, and I don't think many people know. And, I, and it seems to me that indeed um, uh, what is publicly known is already in the crisis. So going back to this broader question of whether uh, behavioral economics can teach us um, anything important about the economy, I do believe that understanding hum human behavior with its limitations can help us understand uh, what's happening around us, but maybe not always in the most obvious ways. So we have to keep an open mind and, uh, and perhaps question sort of this common wisdom that we get uh, through this behavioral angle. Um, I think behavioral economics is primarily engaged in a debate about economics, but it also touches on politics and philosophy. And I think contextualizing the debate properly um, perhaps casts it in a slightly different light. And what I want to lead towards is suggesting that Behavioral economics is interesting, um, has some important and useful um, insights, some consistent and correct predictions, but that they're all very limited. It's not a new theory of the world, it's not a new theory of the economy, and that some of the claims made of it by both its proponents and its detractors are seriously overblown. And I think the first way to contextualise it is to think about the model of rational economic man that the economics profession has worked with for a long time. Because I suggest that that's actually not a great model of um, you know, enlightenment, rational um, human beings. It was actually quite a degraded model of fairly mechanistic people with narrow interests attributed to them who were expected to behave in certain predictable ways in economic contexts. To defend that model for a minute, it's quite useful to make that assumption in economics. Because when you're looking at human economic behaviour in aggregate, when you're looking at particular problems, that actually um, is quite a useful way of modelling outcomes. And it continues to be uh, you know, perhaps even the dominant approach within the economics profession <laughs> even today. You know, that generally works. And behavioural economics is an engagement with that. It points out, draws out some of the limitations, some of the, the gaps in that theory, some of the places where it doesn't work. The efficient market hypothesis that was developed by Eugene Farmer in Chicago was touched on by Emery and is particularly important in this respect because it, it took that model of rational economic um, man even a step further. What the efficient market hypothesis held is that individual acts of irrationality simply didn't matter. It can accept that individuals are irrational, stupid, um, you know, misled by their interests, but that it will be unsystematic irrationality. So in other words, everyone would behave differently, independently, and it would balance out, and then what you get is exactly what Emery described. You'd get prices of, of assets, prices of things, that fully, fairly reflect all of the information that everybody has got. Now, 
I would suggest that behavioural economics is a particularly effective critique of the efficient market hypothesis and perhaps a slightly less effective critique of um, you know, the traditional model of economic man. The reason why it's so effective on the efficient market hypothesis is because it posits that there are certain systematic irrationalities, that we systematically behave in particular ways. I think it would be foolhardy to suggest that it's wrong. What I would like to say is it's right, but it's limited. I'd also like to say that when it, some behavioural economists talk about irrationality, I don't think that they're trying to suggest that you know, we're all a bit crazy and that we need to be reined in. I think what they're doing is criticising the mechanistic model of um, economic man, rational economic man. And that, you know, that has some purchase and, and is, is you know, a reasonable line to pursue in certain circumstances. If you go right back to Adam Smith, he actually understood an awful lot of behavioural economics. He wrote um, um, Wealth of Nations in 1776. In 1756, he wrote Theory of Moral Sentiments. A lot of the things that we've just been talking about, a lot of the experiments that we've been discussing, Adam Smith not only anticipated them, but put it in far more beautiful prose than any um, behavioural economist could come up with. He talked about the way that we are uh, more irrationally averse to loss than we are keen to take profit. He talked about the endowment effect, which is the fact that when you're given something, you value it more highly than if you're offered the chance to buy it. I mean, the famous experiment here is that you give one group of students a mug and you say, how much would you sell that to me for? You show the other group a mug and ask them, how much would you buy this for? The people who have the mug in their hands and have been given it attribute a higher value than the, the group who are offered the chance to buy it. Now, traditional economic theory would say, you know, rational people um, looking after their own interests would come up with the same price. The fact that we don't does tell us something uh, meaningful about you know, pricing, about models, about how we make economic decisions. Coming briefly to the political, um, we've talked a bit about changing behaviour, about you know, encouraging supermarkets to put healthy food in the places where you're more likely to buy it, you know, move the chocolate bars away from the tills. A lot of that is informed by behavioural economic research, you know, the methodology for implementing that, the kind of um, the, the nudge hypothesis. But I don't think any of it is given by the theory of behavioural economics. I mean, behavioural economics is not necessarily normative. It's perhaps unsurprising that many behavioural economists are keen to implement their own theories and their own experiments and research and you know, aggrandise their own positions. But it's not a criticism of the theory to say that it's used for certain ends that may be illiberal. I think that that's uh, a separate political debate about whether or not we should nudge people, that we should take away from the debate about behavioural economics. Finally, just turning to some of the issues around the credit crunch and you know, what it can tell us about that, I think the main point to make here is that it's not necessarily trying to tell us anything about that. I mean, behavioural economists are dealing with um, small questions rather than big questions. They're not necessarily trying to give us an account of the macroeconomy. Um, I'm, I'm personally very sceptical of the idea that it ever will, that it ever will create models, testable hypotheses, ma or macroeconomic theory. Um, you know, but I'm, I'm happy to keep an open mind. What I would say is that right now, it isn't doing that, and it isn't aspiring to do any of that. And it would be wrong, I think, to criticise behavioural economics for failing to um, give us an account of the credit crunch just as much as it would be for criticising it for failing to repair your car. I mean, it's simply not a tool that's designed towards that end. And the other thing is that, in some ways, it systematises and theorises things that we've known for a very long time. And a good example would be um, on the trading floor. Um, the idea of loss aversion is in practice, very well understood. This is the theory that you're going to be quite happy to sell something that's gone up in value and take a profit. But if something's fallen in value, you will tend to hang on to it until it's recovered its value. So you kind of sit on your losses. It's kind of Nick Leeson thing where you hide, it, hide the bad news in the cupboard. But traders have had stop-loss limits imposed by their employers, imposed by the banks, for decades. And you know the idea that we've got a fundamentally new account of the world and how humans behave because of behavioural economics, I think is misplaced. People who um, organise 
shelving in supermarkets, people who manage traders, have intuitively understood many of these things anyway. Which is why, in some ways, behavioural economics is perhaps about educating economics professors about the real world, rather than educating people in the real world about how things work. So that leaves us with the, the, the big challenge, which is, you know, how do we account for this, and what is the economic theory? And I think that one of the great... Um, missed opportunities of the crisis has been that economics and economics professors have just been tricksters. You know, they've given us some cute examples, some neat experiments, some nice sound bites, but we have been, I, I think, denied um, a more robust engagement with what's going on, a more robust account of the macroeconomic um, issues underlying it. I think you don't need behavioural economics to account for things like bubbles. I mean, if you look at people like Hyman Minsky, who is reinterpreting Keynes to account for bubbles, this kind of thing, I think, is a far richer and more productive source of uh, insight than um, you know, a few experiments by behavioural economics. So personally, I'm very supportive and interested in behavioural economics. I think it does tell us useful things, but I think that the claims made for it are vastly um, inflated to the detriment of behavioural economists as much as the rest of us. Uh, Amory, you, you said that you know, people claim after the facts that they saw it coming. Now, as it happens, I'm not, I'm not sure if that is true. I mean, a number of behavioural economists claim that they did see this coming before it happened. Now, maybe that is a hindsight bias. I, I don't know. Um, but they will say that, you know, we've been talking about the irrationality of bankers for a long time and being driven by, you know, short-term interests. And it, it, with hindsight, that story seems to make a certain amount of sense. But in fact, I think it's a wrong story. Um, in an overinflated property market where the price of property is increasing, 100% loan-to-value mortgages that people cannot pay still make sense as long as the value of the property that they hold is rising faster than the, the price of the debt that they hold. And as it fact, I would expect bankers to realise that, recognise that, and make money out of it. That's what they're paid to do. It's completely and utterly rational to do that. Of course, it bursts. And then, in hindsight, you go, oops, that was a mistake. But nobody could predict precisely when it was going to pop. Nobody could know when it was all going to fall down. And if you didn't engage in that kind of behaviour when the property market was booming, your shareholders would punish you for it. So either way, you absolutely couldn't win under those circumstances. And of course, everybody played the game. And it was a completely rational game, I would say. Uh, I actually agree as well that it's uh, not the bankers that were being irrational. The bankers were doing exactly what they, uh, their incentive said. Um, it's the, it was the people buying and selling the houses, or mainly buying them. Um, and uh, I think, yes, you, you can also explain that in, in a, a rational way. You can say that the people had uh, limited information. They were acting according to the information they have. Fair enough, that's, that's rational in, in a sense. Uh, but I think that what this theory... Uh, can do is it can shed light on how systematically uh, that information asymmetry works, uh, systematically what, that, what the results are, and I think that most behavioural economists are a bit unambitious actually for their theory. As Michael said, they don't generally have the aspiration to turn it into a macroeconomic theory, but they should. Uh, I think that economists in general have a little bit of a lack of confidence in, in this case, in their own mathematical abilities. It took about... Um, 175 years to get from uh, Adam Smith or probably mm -hmm. David Ricardo um, mm -hmm. to uh, Arrow de Brugge, which is the, uh, the kind of mm -hmm. proof that if people are rational, then uh, the economy will reach equilibrium. And, uh, you know, I really hope it isn't going to take another 175 to get to uh, a better understanding that reflects uh, this new uh, model of decision making. I think behavioural economics can perhaps explain. Um, or, or try to account for the boom in prices, you know, the way that people were, were bidding up and flipping houses. I, I don't think it aspires to explain really what the bankers were doing, and I think that is much more about the incentive structures within the banks. I think that's correct. That said, I think it's important to realise that there was a huge variety between institutions, and actually many banks did pull back from the mortgage market, didn't do anything like 100% loans, um, and, and others just, just really went for it. So, you know, there was scope to align incentives better or worse between institutions. But, you know, I think that's perhaps slightly off topic. Economists want to have sort of a theory of the economy. So it's a big, big goal. So it's, you know, theory of everything. As opposed to psychologists who are happy about uh, 
looking at people in very narrow sort of set of circumstances, and it doesn't have to be necessarily consistent. Things don't need to be, you know, uh, th there doesn't need to be like a big theory. You know, it can be in little compartments. Yeah. So in that sense, you know, as you you see, econ you know, behavioral economists sort of try to move ec economics towards psychology. So in that sense, I think it's natural that they don't, they cannot offer a theory that covers everything. So that's by the sort of that's the whole point, in a way. I work in education, and it's the expansion of behaviourist explanations for all areas of life, not just economic um, behaviours. And one of the things that it's leading to, supported by very sort of populist and simplistic references to things like the emotional brain, is actually the degradation of psychology downwards into emotion, which is a very sort of different um, aspect of it. And what it's leading to... Uh, particularly in education, is a massive expansion of state intervention in social training. So once you start to say that people have irrational, emotional responses to all aspects of life, whether it's their economic behaviour or their responses to the economic crisis, what it allows schools to do, and you can see it um, growing massively, is the training of things like financial well-being for five-year-olds or emotional well-being for all children. And conversely, once you start to say that our responses to things like the economic crisis or the social crisis are emotional responses, the state can then expand counselling and behavioural therapy into all sorts of areas, including therapy for the unemployed. So it's not just the expansion of uh, psychology into economics, it's a symptom of the expansion of the degraded psychology of emotion into all areas of life. Um, I think with behavioural economics, I really agree with the critique, but I'm really worried about the solutions that it proposes as an alternative. Like, at best, on like, the smaller issues about getting people to recycle their towels in hotels, fine. But on the bigger issues, the issues that actually have any significance, things like having default pension plans, for example, I'm really not sure I want to be nudged into those kind of big decisions. Um, I think one thing that the financial crisis and the MPs' expenses scandals have kind of revealed to us is that our experts um, aren't, one, always that expert, and two, aren't always like out for looking after our interests. And I'd much rather um, make my own decisions and with full information and be treated like an autonomous individual who can do that rather than someone to be patronised. I think that whatever the intention of the uh, behavioural e economics, the world has moved on. And I've heard some good examples of that already. But even at the macroeconomic level, the Obama uh, administration is consciously using behavioural economics to try to nudge people into thinking that the recession is over. So effectively, what's happening is that it's been part of the whole, become part of the whole evasion of, uh, of addressing the, the proper causes of the, of the recession, as we've discussed earlier. George Osborne, the Shadow Chancellor, made a speech a couple of weeks ago in which he, he consciously again said you know, that behavioural economics tells us that the, the individual cannot be trusted, uh, and he proposed uh, a cooling off period for store cards so that people wouldn't just go off and spend money. They're using behavioural economics already to justify more and more regulation. That's already out there. We have to resist this for, uh, for, for all kinds of reasons, I think. Uh, but mainly, I think, at the level of, of governments. Uh, we should ask the question, if all of these individuals, if all of us individuals are so irrational, surely just getting together in the form of a state just makes the, the state irrational. I mean, you know, there is no logical follow-through to this theory which makes any sense to me at the macroeconomic level. The lady at the back making the point about pensions is a very good one. Um, it is, we're told constantly um, that if you're in your 20s and you put a, a hundred pounds a month or whatever into your pension, when you get to 65 you're going to be rich. So wouldn't that be a wonderfully rational thing to do? Well, maybe, maybe not. There are lots of really good reasons why in your 20s you need that extra hundred quid a month. And there are other things that you will want to spend it on. So if we are nudged into making that decision um, without our input, then what that reflects is a removal of our own choices. 
And it is authoritarian. You know, it is um, removing our decision-making capacity. I would actually disagree also, though, on the, the towel thing. And in some ways, the towel thing annoys me even more because that reinforces a particular moral view of the world which I am increasingly forced to buy into. And it's not just towels. You know, it is the, the food we eat, the amount we drink, where we go, what we do, when we do it, who we sleep with, and so on and so forth. There are so many areas of life where it's been seriously considered we ought to be nudged into doing something different. And it's enforcing a conformism with a particular view of the world, which I may or may not um, buy into. Um, so I, I do object to that. One thing I will say just to completely undermine myself is that behavioral economics, econo economists, I do think, also lack um, a belief in humanity. So once we start to learn about these nudges, we can at least start to um, undermine their effects. So if your waiter draws a smiley face on your, on your bill, you tend to give a bigger tip. But now that you know that, next time you see that smiley face on the receipt, you can say, stuff you, I'm going to give you half the amount of tip instead. Maybe that behavioural economists have a, a limited view of humanity, but uh, if so, then normal economists must be uh, even more limited. Um, it's a nice philosophy to say that we should all make our decisions completely free and in the possession of all the facts and all the information um, that's relevant, but it does come up against the fact that it's impossible. You cannot be in possession of all that information. Um, if the, by essentially careful thought out planning, and this can be on a personal level as much as a governmental, we can get access to more information, take more of it into account, we will make better decisions. And if someone can provide the service by uh, doing some of that for us, then why not? None of this nudging is about forcing 20-year-olds to spend £100 a month on a pension. Um, the whole point is that you can opt out of it and, and make that choice if you have the information, if you have the electricity meter that uh, tells you how much electricity you're using, you can just ignore it, but more likely you won't. So uh, I think these are uh, very useful tools that are um, rarely, uh, uh, never, I think, forcing people to do things that they don't want to do. Oh. I think if you're trying to get to grips with behavioural economics and what is weak and problematic about behavioural economics, you have to take up the core of the theory, not just its sometimes authoritarian consequences. Uh, and the thing that really strikes me is that the difference between neoclassical economics and behavioural economics is completely exaggerated in this discussion. Why is it exaggerated? Neoclassical economics takes this model of rational economic man and it says, this is how people behave, let's build a model of the economy on that assumption, on that basis. Behavioural economics says, let's take this model of rational economic man, but let's expand it to have a broader view of what rationality constitutes. And let's build a model of the economy on that basis, on a slightly more sophisticated model of uh, rational econo economic man or economic person, whatever it's called nowadays. Uh, but the, methodologically, it's a completely weak approach because you cannot understand the economy by just taking one individual consumer or one individual investor and generalising from the experience of that individual investor or consumer. You have to see the big picture, understand broader relationships in the economy. So I think what's wrong with economics nowadays is not the fact that it has this narrow view of rationality. It's because we don't have big thinking. We don't have abstract thinking. We kind of fetishise the financial sector and don't understand how it's related to the real economy. Uh, and both neoclassical economics and behavioural economics share those core weaknesses. I agree that it's not a, a distinction between rational versus irrational. I think it is... Um, it's an aspiration to make psychologically more realistic assumptions about human behavior within the economic models. This is, uh, and so in that there is nothing that's irrational versus irrational, it's just more realistic, I'll put it that way. I'm really sorry, but it ain't the 1970s anymore. Now, I'm not here to defend rational economic man. I mean, that was a wrong model of what human beings are as well. But at least the assumption of rational economic man was that we could go out and make banal consumer decisions all by ourselves, and there wasn't any need for any interference with that. Irrational economic man, on the other hand, makes the assumption that we can't do that. And so, therefore, we need to be instructed, nudged, modified, however you want to put it. That is a detrimental um, step and one that we should oppose and reject.